<laughs> Good evening, folks. If you're just joining us, uh, Smitty Story Hour will start in just a few moments, featuring Bethany Gerritsen, class of 2009. Um, as always, um, if throughout the session you have any questions, if you would just pop them into the Q&A or into the chat feature. Uh, this session is being recorded, and I remembered to hit the button. Um, <laughs> let's see. Um, if you would also share with us in the chat um, your name, of course, uh, your class year, if you happen to be an alum, and where you're joining us from. Um, what else can I tell you? Uh, the Smitty Story Hour series has been brought to you by the Paul Smith College Alumni Association, sort of our way of keeping our Smitties connected to Paul Smith while we have to stay socially distant, hopefully not for much longer. We're getting close, Bethany. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so again, it's the Smitty Story Hour. Um, we're being recorded. Uh, the recording will be shared on our website, so you can come back and view it again if you miss something or if you have to leave us early for any reason, um, you can mm -hmm. log back in and take a look at what we talked about. You can also view other Smitty Story Hours that we've had. And of course, we have upcoming scheduled guests. April 8th is Dr. Jory Favreau. April 22nd, Joe Canto, class of 85, and Jamie Berdowski, class of 2005. May 13th, we have Corey Laxon, class of 98. Um, and with that, Bethany, if you're ready, we're ready for you. Sweet. So I can share my screen? It's all yours. All right. I'll get this going. Hi, everyone. Great to see you. <laughs> see how this gets going. One more Zoom of the day right here. Okay, so thank you all for coming out and being a part of this. And my name is Bethany Gerritsen and I graduated from Paul Smith in 2009. I was a transfer student and I ended my four year degree at Paul Smith. And I came up here with another college. We actually came up to play some sports teams up here. I played soccer and basketball. And I remember just going through the Adirondacks and seeing the mountains and seeing the rocks and really falling in love with it. And my mom was actually the one that told me about this little college in the Adirondacks and I ended up transferring. So tonight I'm going to talk to you about diversity, equity and inclusion in the outdoors. So going back to my mom, <laughs> she's a big part of my origin story even how I got to Paul Smith's college. And on this slide, my mom is in the black and white photo. She has the basketball, she's pointing. And my mom is a huge inspiration of mine. She was a Title IX athlete, like one of the first uh, females to be able to play on an organized sports team at her high school. And that was really amazing. She went on to coach thousands of women in soccer and basketball. And she was a four sport athlete. She did soccer, basketball, softball, and she was also a cheerleader. And so she's just been a huge um, inspiration in my life. And she really mentored me in sports. And so sports are gonna be like this reoccurring theme in my presentation tonight, because one, it's one of the reasons why I came to the Adirondacks and why I came to Paul Smith's and soccer was the leading force behind that at the time. But now I'm a mountain athlete and I'll get a little bit more into that later of what that even means. <laughs> and um, so I'll just go over real quick, like who I am, where I'm from at this point for those of you out there who don't know me. So I grew up in a small town called Cherry Valley it's in central New York. And that top photo is me in high school playing soccer. And um, I played center mid. Uh, soccer was my passion growing up and then basketball as well. 
And there's a little picture of me when I was a kid. Um, I've liked hats my whole life, apparently. So, um, yep, good old trucker hats. And today I teach at Paul Smith College. I, I'm really proud to teach there. I also teach a course for Clarkston University and I do side projects as well with some nonprofits and I also do some writing. So hi everyone coming in. And so I went to SUNY schools, so state schools in New York to start my college career. Coming out of high school, I really didn't know what I wanted to do um, other than maybe continue to play sports and maybe something with the environment. So I was a science major at the time. And then I transferred to Paul Smith College and I became an environmental, oh, I think my, I think my, um, I froze for a second. So I'm gonna just go back a little bit there. I was a science major. And so that photo is me um, at SUNY Cobaskill playing soccer. And then I transferred to Paul Smith College where I was here for two and a half years as a student. And I switched from science to environmental studies because I really wanted to engage with the public. And at the time there was a lot in the media around climate change. And I, I respect the science. I, it's super valuable that people are out in the field doing it. And I just felt that a lot of the research had already been done. And there was a piece missing between like scientists and the general public. And so I wanted to help communicate uh, between the two sides. And that's really what I've dedicated my career to is storytelling and helping people relate through story. And so environmental studies is much more, is much more humanities and writing based, based and art based. So I enjoyed that a lot. That photo of me by the tree is when I was a Paul Smith college student and I did a lot of crazy things when I was a student at Paul Smith. And for one of my classes, we um, collected trash around campus and we decorated some trees and did a little media stunt with it. And um, so that was just one thing I did. And um, I also wrote for the college magazine and I was also playing soccer and basketball as well. So coming out of college, I worked uh, as a wilderness therapy instructor. And before I did that in 2009, I worked AmeriCorps. I went to Little Rock, Arkansas, and I worked at a camp there with youth. And it was a really great experience. And um, it was a camp and school for kids. And so I worked there and then I came back to the Adirondacks and I continued to work in wilderness therapy. So wilderness therapy is one of the classes I now teach at Paul Smith. And, and what it is, it's really combining an outdoor experience with some therapeutic tools and really getting people to just reflect on their life. And I worked specifically with teenagers in the Adirondacks and the teenagers, they were dealing with addiction, depression, anxiety, um, personal trauma. And we would go backpacking in the Adirondacks. And as a field instructor, I worked a week on, a week off. And that's when I really started to become a mountain athlete. I didn't really have a background at all in camping when I went on my field training it was the first time that I wore a full pack and I thought it was gonna kill me. <laughs> I really struggled getting up this hill we had to climb and I was like, this is not worth it. It was like rainy, it was wet and cold. And I was like, this is insane. I don't wanna do this at all. And I was really about to quit. I was going to go up to you know, the, the lead instructors and just be like, nope, I, I made a mistake. This isn't what I wanna do. 
And, but I didn't say anything and I like made it through the night. And by the next day, I just felt like stronger and I felt this shift in me. And by the end of my training, I even felt like new muscles that I had never really felt with any other sports. And it was a really beautiful experience. And I knew I wanted to work with kids and teenagers and help them and teach them and so that's what I did for the next four years and I'm so thankful for it it really I think taught me more about myself than any other time in my life and um so it's it's beautiful I love that we have some components of that at Paul Smith now in our psych program and our rec program and that I get to teach it um, for my students as well because there's so many parallels between um, individual healing and then like creating healthy communities, um, addressing trauma and healing. So at the same time, uh, I was also in grad school towards the last few years of being a wilderness therapy instructor. And I found this really amazing program uh, thanks to Tom Huber and thanks to Mike Recklin. And it was called Future Generations. It's a school out of West Virginia. And I was able to study conservation and community development in India and Namibia and Nepal. And we also studied in the United States and um, having classmates from all over the world really helped me get a bigger perspective of environmental and social justice issues and that we really have to have global dialogue around these. So it was a perfect pairing of wilderness therapy and my grad school research and just what I was experiencing at this time. And then, and then after that, I came, oh, I'm one slide ahead of myself. <laughs> I eventually get to Paul Smith to teach. Um, but before I do that, still in grad school, I started to focus more of my research and work on women empowerment and community development and looking at the countries we were going to and um, what was going on for equity for women. And so, you know, a lot of heartbreaking stories around the world. And I really feel near and dear, dear to Nepal. And I work with a, a nonprofit over there empowering Nepali women. And it's a the guiding company that was started by three Nepali sisters. And it was the first company ever in that field started by women and run by women. And that was in the 1990s. And they specifically train Nepali females to be mountain guides. And today in 2021, they have a really successful business nonprofit. And um, they also run a school for Nepali girls um, who, because of poverty, are forced out of their families and lots of times, um, you know, end up in poverty themselves or very worse situations. Um, lots of times human trafficking into India is where a lot of the girls end up. So I was started doing that when I was 28. And um, in 2018, I took a group of Paul Smith students to Nepal and we worked with them and we tracked with them and it was a really amazing experience. So some of the big lessons that I learned from my time in grad school and um, wilderness therapy was we should always try to build from success when working with communities, you know, don't just come in and say like all the things you're doing wrong or all the things you see to like improve. You wanna take that one quality that the community has and build from it that's working. And for me as an athlete, that really resonated of, you know, like let's work with what you're doing well right now and then identify where you need to get stronger. So I was always able to break down like individually what to do and then apply it to community development. And that's what I do a lot today uh, in my classes. So also too, when working with communities, use the energy of the community resources, um, especially like monetary aren't always available to communities. So let's see what we can do um, through just human energy and what the community wants. So really go to the people and learn from them. And I think that's just a good lesson for 
for everyone. You know, we don't have all the answers and um, really some of the, I think the best knowledge comes from the people who live it in the field and to listen to them and hear their stories. So one of the programs I run at Paul Smith is the storytelling fellowships. And um, a few students each year are selected to gather stories from around the world and they pick their topic and they pick um, who they're going to talk to. And we've had students go to South Africa, um, the American South. We have some students working on a storytelling project um, around the, Mex the Mexican American border and immigration. So, Today, I am an instructor at Paul Smith College, and I really love it. I am so happy to be back at Paul Smith, and got my little water bottle right here. Uh, not gonna lie, I actually, I love teaching at Paul Smith way more than when I was a student uh, there. I think I struggled a little bit with college and um, just being motivated to, to go to class and all that fun stuff, but um, I really enjoy it today. And some of the classes I teach are Adirondack Studies, which is like an Adirondack history course with the freshman students. And we go out into the field. I teach them a bit about the woods and the Adirondacks and the history. And we do some hiking. And then I also teach diversity and inclusion by design. And that's an exploration into the outdoor industry and the history of it and how it's been a pretty um, exclusive field for its history. I also teach therapeutic recreation, which I've talked about a little bit. And that's a very hands-on course where the students, we work through some of the tools, uh, we get outside a lot and um, teach them how to build fires and like make shelters and stuff like that. And um, I really feel and believe that like, you know, healing trauma, it's individual and it's cultural and we have to address it on individual and community levels. So that's a thread that goes into all of my classes that I teach. And I also um, teach for Clarkson University. They run a Adirondack semester at Paul Smith College. And I work with those students every fall and that's really exciting to do. So a little bit like the second, I'm just checking my time too. Sometimes it's funny, you know, like time just goes by and like you've been talking for 20 minutes. So, um, so the second half of this presentation is now a bit more about the diversity, equity and inclusion in the outdoors. And that starts with land acknowledgement and acknowledging that Adirondack history does not start when the lumberjacks show up in the 1800s. And unfortunately, a lot of uh, history textbooks are written in that way of, you know, the Adirondacks were this wild remote place that no one lived in, um, no one really used other than natives, perhaps for some hunting and fishing, but they didn't live here. And I remember being a student in the early 2000s and that's what was taught and it's just not true. And our very own Kurt Steger has done a lot of research on that along, along with the Six Nations and the natives of the Six Nations, uh, very much proving that this land was used and lived on for thousands of years, pretty much since the, like, you know, the ice recedes, this is tundra-like uh, terrain, very similar to what you would find at high altitude, um, well, high elevation, uh, Mount Marcy, Algonquin, Skylight, where we have Alpine zone. So you have like a very uh, shrubby tundra. And, but once the ice receded, you know, people lived here and they were hunting and they were fishing and there's a lot of evidence of that. So Adirondack history starts with land acknowledgement of the Haudenosaunee and that's people of the Longhouse. And that photo there is at the Six Nations Museum. So I like to take my students there early on in the semester to really start the course there. And that's, that's run by the Faddens, 
a Mohawk family and they do a really great job of um, teaching their culture and their history. And even the word Adirondacks, it is Mohawk based and it means bark eater. So uh, another thing I do uh, besides teach at Paul Smith's, I am a brand ambassador for She Jumps. See the hat, it's, you know, <laughs> it's a graphicorn. It's a, it's a really cool logo. <laughs> and um, so She Jumps is an organization that works to increase the participation of women and girls in outdoor activities. And some of the work I do with them is lead uh, it's all virtual right now, but leading events in the Northeast that just try to increase uh, women and girls in the outdoors. Um, and that top picture is my friend Anu that is in Namibia on the Atlantic side of Namibia. So I thought that was cool. Like, you know, the Atlantic reaches all these different places and and then that other photo was also taken in Namibia as well. So something I also do, and one of the reasons I got involved with She Jumps is in September, my friend Katie Rhodes and I, we became the first females to complete the Adirondack through hike unsupported, which means that we hiked 183 miles with 65,000 feet elevation gain in seven days, four hours, 50 minutes. And we started in the steward range and we walked. We walked the whole time. We had all our food. We had everything packed for this seven days. We received no aid of any sort. It was just her and I. And we ended on Esther Mountain and so we became the first women to complete this trip and it raised a lot of attention, awareness. We were also doing it as a fundraiser at the time for um, suicide awareness. There's this organization called 46 Climbs and they run a big fundraiser every September and it's suicide awareness month. And Katie has a really personal story with it. She lost her brother to suicide in 2012. So she knew she wanted to do a fundraiser with our hike, um, whether or not we made it, but we ended up making it. And we raised a good amount of funds and awareness. And that led to She Jumps reaching out to us to do a talk on what we did and how we did it. And so then I became a brand ambassador for them and continued to work on you know, breaking down the barriers of first really in the outdoor industry because it's been so predominantly white and male and there's a lot of first to break down. And um, it does matter, you know, to see yourself in that field and competing in that field. And lots of times, you know, I'll speak personally from being a woman in this field is you're told that you're not as fast, you're not as strong, and it's just not true, especially in endurance sports. And that's one message that I'm really trying to teach to my students. And strength is a really, I feel open-ended like definition. And um, we're all strong in different ways. So um, that photo there, us with the glasses on, that's at the end of the through hike our eyes at that point were like so puffy. We had some like real fluid retention going on. Um, and it was kind of hilarious. As soon as our bodies were done hiking after that seven days, like we just kind of began shutting down a little bit. Katie's legs like got really, really puffy. It was hard for her to walk um, like a few weeks afterwards. Um, mine did okay. So um, the through hike is a field called FKTs, which is fastest known times. And that's the field that I compete in now. And I do everything from like short distance to long distance to ultra distance. So ultra distance is anything over marathon length. 
So anything over 26.2 miles is considered an ultra. And that's the field I really like. Um, I feel like I get a little better, the longer it gets, uh, a little bit harder it gets. And that's when I really start to thrive a little bit more. So I have a lot of fun with it. And yeah, at this point, I am um, pretty much done. And I, I feel my ending message here for everyone is, you know, be a part of this movement, this, um, this new age in outdoor rec and outdoor education and help it be more inclusive, help it be more diverse, um, have these conversations. Uh, and I try to encourage my students to do that as well. And also like, you know, be an ally and, you know, be kind and, um, you know, enjoy the outdoors. And I want it to be accessible to everyone. And this is the message that I'll end on, especially after my time as a wilderness therapy instructor. There's so much good stuff that can happen outside that everyone should have access to that. So you can follow me at Bethany Climbs. You can also follow Diversity at Paul Smith PSC. So if you use, um, yeah, those are the Instagram handles right there. Okay, do we have any questions for Bethany? You guys are pretty quiet. Yeah, <laughs> so are my students. <laughs> It's funny. Well, I just, as you're talking, I'm like, boy, I don't do anything. No. <laughs> and that's another thing I should say too. It's, you know, like, um, not everyone has to go out and hike, you know, 183 miles. The through hike can be something different for everyone. It can be. Well, every time you announce another one that you're doing, I'm like, I haven't been up St. Regis <laughs> in a really long time. Yeah. And you know, that's our mountain. We're supposed to climb that one frequently and I just don't. Yeah. And then, um, oh, we have a question. Okay. Did you hike in Nepal? Yes. Yep. So in Nepal, we went into the Annapurna area. So we hiked up to um, Poon Hill. So that's about 10,000 feet elevation. And when I was in Nepal, I hiked in towards the Annapurna base camp area. So I've been to Nepal a few times and I hope to do some bigger mountains in Nepal as well. And um, hopefully we'll be going there with um, maybe a collaboration of St. Lawrence and Paul Smith students in 2022. Hopefully. Excellent. Yeah. yeah, hopefully. Yep. That'd be great. Um, so what other hikes do you want to do? What What's your big one you want to do? What's the biggest thing you want to do? So what I have coming up this summer is going after the 46 supported fastest known time. So that in that scenario, I get to be paced. I get to be resupplied on trail so I can go really fast and a light like and um, so that, that record is three days and five hours for, it's about 150 miles. So you have to be putting down about like 50 miles a day. And um, so that's the one I'm going after this summer. Okay. All right. Yeah. And when you say supported, what does your support team look like? That's a great question. So it's really pretty organized if you want to be successful at it because really everything has to go right and so for me to hit my paces and my splits and my times you know you have to have people at certain places on trail and so the woman I did the through hike with Katie Rhodes like we're besties now and she's going to be my coordinator she is my coordinator and we have like an Excel sheet with like the splits and the times and then who's gonna come in, when to pace with what gear. So it's really like, it's the end of March now and we're actively in training. We're trying out all these systems. Like it's why we get out in the field a lot together so we can just keep working together. Um, you know, she knows me really well. She knows when I might be tanking or I need some like food or you know like right. to drink more so it's really there's a lot that goes into it and then 
you almost need a support team for your support team because they're putting in long miles with you as well and um, they need rest and it's um, setting up camps and setting up resupply stations and then having like um, medical support for taping and stuff like that. So awesome. if, yeah, that's the big one right now. Um, is crowding in the high peaks an issue when hiking for speed? Ooh, that's <laughs> yeah. Good question. yeah, it definitely is. It is. Um, you know, there's some areas that I don't go to at certain times just because it's going to be really crowded. So we're going to try to hit dirt. <laughs> sorry, we're going to try to hit different sections at different times. One thing I will say is um, not all of the high peaks are very crowded. It's, it's very specific peaks. So we're just going to try to avoid the weekends, you know, so we're looking for like a Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday of ideal weather and um, perhaps early June to beat that big summer rush. Right. And then we're pretty much just looking at early June or right before the semester would start in August. So it definitely factors in. And even when Katie and I did the through hike, we waited till after Labor Day. Right. For right. there to be, yeah. Makes a lot of sense. And I can kind of imagine which peaks just driving yeah it's past the, the trailhead you know which ones they are yeah we all know <laughs> yeah yeah the ones out of the lodge get a lot of traffic so you're Algonquin yeah. Marcy that whole circle absolutely is PSC still partnering with Knowles Ooh, so that's a great question for Kendra or Eric and to my knowledge it's no. I think we struggled. Well, I know we struggled with filling uh, the class size. And then because of COVID, I really don't know what the current situation is, but right. we did run, I think one or two, it might've just been one semester with Knowles. Okay. Um, I haven't heard about them, but I just assumed it was COVID related. So yeah. Um, yeah, it's been a few. Um, so what if you're just starting out as a hiker? Bethany, I haven't hiked Cascade since 1997. Mm -hmm. I want to do it again someday. What yeah. do I do to start again? Where do I go? What do I, what, what's first? Okay. So some just like baseline fitness is really great to do too. Oh, so. never mind. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> no, no. Um, Paul Smith's college actually has this really great facility called the Vic. Oh, I think I've heard of that. Steve, you know of that? <laughs> and um, I, when I was training for the through hike and other stuff I've done, you don't always want to be on that real, that real steep elevation. So some of your more mild, gentle, like rolling, start there and start doing a few loops, maybe three miles, work up to five miles. And then I would recommend doing the Saranac Sixer. So Mount Baker, um, St. Regis is one of them, Haystack, Mackenzie, Scarface, and there's the LP Niner. Okay, I've, I've heard that one. What are the, it's the Sixer plus three more, yes? Is that right or wrong? Yeah, so there's ampersand in the Sixer. So St. Regis, ampersand, Baker, Haystack, McKenzie, Scarface. And then the LP Niner is a few of the smaller mountains around Lake Placid. Okay. Yep, so that's where I would start and find a friend uh, <laughs> who is going to keep you accountable and will get out with you. And because it's also, you know, you want to feel safe. You want to have your systems in check and go on nice days to like get those hiking juices flowing again. Is that sirens near you? Yeah. <laughs> I've been looking out the windows. I'm like, I'm not seeing anything here. I'm at Paul Smith. So I'm like, there's nothing happening here. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was here. crazy to hear sirens. <laughs> crazy. That's keen. Um, really? Yeah, we actually get a few here. Yeah. 
Yep, nice. the fire station is right up the road. Uh, of course. Nice firehouse they have now. Yep. Yeah. All right, folks. Well, I'm not seeing any more questions come in. If you want to know any more about um, what Bethany does here on campus or about taking a hike, I'm sure you could reach out to her here or you can reach out to me in the alumni office and I'll put you two in contact. Yes. Um, Steve, did you have anything you wanted to add or? I just want to thank Bethany. That, that was wonderful. So thank you very much. You, uh, you've got quite a few stamps on your passport, I can tell. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I'm looking forward to getting back out there. It's been a year in the Adirondacks, which has actually been kind of nice, too. I had to find some hiking projects around here, and that led to the through hike, so I, I can't complain there. Are you still with us, Steve? Oh, I yes. thought you froze. <laughs> no, no, yeah. it's just, uh, so thank you, everybody. And again, you find the recordings on our website. And uh, I think Heather's got the uh, agenda for the next uh, couple of um, Smitty Story Hours coming up. Sure. So the next one coming up, we have Jory Favro on April 8th. Watch your email and social media. We'll be announcing that um, or inviting you. Oh, wait. Oh, we have a thank you. I thought we had a question. Yeah. A thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, thank you, Bethany, for being here with us tonight. It's always good to have another alum um, on a Smitty Story Hour so we can outnumber Steve, of course. But um, <laughs> I'm a Smitty wannabe. Yeah. You can still go. I know people in admissions. <laughs> um, so usually at the beginning of this, Bethany, I don't know if you've caught it, but I usually call out to people that I recognize their names. So Amy and Jay Herodin, class of 84 and 89, over there in Vermont, counting down the days till they come to watch their son graduate this oh, May 8th. That's exciting. It's very exciting. And I'm so glad Jay's home tonight. He's missed a couple of these. Um, Ron Perlick. Now, Ron, usually a couple weeks from now, you'd be on your motorcycle heading towards us to go to Sugarbush breakfast. Unfortunately, we won't be having that this year. But if you come up, you know, I'll meet in town by breakfast. Um, Homer Reese, class of 68 in Portland, Oregon. Who else do we have? Oh, Karen and Peter Frank, class of 83, with their dog Rocket, of course. Um, <laughs> see, I got to scroll back. Steve Frederick, who's that? Um, Bob Knapp in Connecticut, class of 73. I don't think Bob's missed any of these stories. I don't think I so. I think he gets the blue star, the sticker. I'm going to have to check our roster. I'm pretty sure Ron per Perlick's made them all too. We're going to have to double check. <laughs> Take attendance. <laughs> all right. Well, thanks again, everyone. Thank you, Bethany. Thanks, Steve. And um, we'll see you next time. Thank yeah. you, everybody. Thank you. Have a good night. Thanks. That was great, Bethany. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, guys, for having me.